Hare Krishna. I'm grateful to be here amongst all of you today. And recently I was doing a college program, a company program in America, a big company. So they wanted to prepare the trailer for that program. And the trailer they had used uh, uh, extremely high tech effects. So it was like a sophisticated movie trailer. And then I saw the trailer and I said that. After that trailer, my clock off will be an anti-climax. <laughs> <laughs> so after Ravi Shankar's introduction, whatever I speak will be like an anti-climax now. <laughs> so, uh, it's his kindness that he's spoken some things about me. I'm struggling sadhaka, trying to find some way to use my passion. And because I'm the association of devotees, so somehow that passion is being used compassionately. So, I'll speak today and uh, Sunday on this topic of uh, Are some people innately evil? Are some people innately evil? Basically, are all people changeable? Is human nature something which is just there with us and it can't be changed? Or is it changeable? And uh, in this section, I'm going to talk about <coughs> and today and on Sunday, I'll take Mandodari verses. This is, this is spoken by Mandodari after the death of Brahma. Which is 60 verses, I'll take the first one today and the third one on Sunday. And broadly, we'll discuss this topic in this understanding that <coughs> we all are trying to change ourselves. And sometimes we try to change ourselves and we struggle and we fail. Sometimes we try to change others and they struggle and fail. And then we feel a sense of failure because they struggle and fail. So, you know, how much is something changeable? Now, Mandodari was a, was a person who was very close to the person who was extremely evil. So now, but she stayed by him, and now the words that she speaks reveals what she thinks about him and how she manages his departure. So basically, <coughs> you know, two people may have the same view, but they take a different view. You can refer to what we see with the eyes. And you refers to how we understand things. So the same incidents can be seen in different ways by different people. In fact, some academic scholars try to point out the differences between the various biographies of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. In Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, there are several significant differences. And they are primarily because each author is having their own focus on what they are trying to convey. So, Chaitanya Bhagavad, for example, focuses on how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is exalted and how his associates are also very exalted. So therefore, Sarvam Bhattacharya is depicted there as if he is already a devotee but a covered devotee. Whereas in Chaitanya Chaitanya, the focus is on establishing the philosophical position of <coughs> Shri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teachings. It's a, it's a book of theology in the format of a biography. It's not a simple biography. That's why Chaitanya Chaitanya Tamil. Mm, whenever the philosophical conversation starts, it like slows down. The incidents are described fast, but the conversations are described badly. So for the purpose of describing how, say, Sarvabhattacharya was converted, so then the stress is on, okay, he had non-devotional antecedents and he came out of it. So there can be different perspectives of the same event. And if somebody is living with someone and you know that person is evil, and then hope springs eternal in the human heart, we hope that that person will change. And we keep trying. So Mandodari kept trying like that. And ultimately, when Ravana is killed, to say her mission is unsuccessful. But that time, how does she see this? So this verse, she is telling, she is referring to this, the Bhagavad is a poetry. 
So it's uh, many places the poetic ornaments come together. So here we see Loka Ravana Ravana. So Ravana was his name and he was the person also who caused distress to others. Loka Ravana. So here he's saying that now you have been killed and she's not saying who will be go to shelter. I will go to shelter. He's saying where will Lanka get shelter of? That Kamyaya Charanam Lanka. Where will Lanka go for being shelter? And in the next verse, she will say that actually it was you did not understand the power of Sita. And she said, interestingly, she was over Mahabhagavan. You are fortunate, you are greatly fortunate, but you didn't understand the power of Sita. And thus, you were killed by her. Which is also very interesting analysis. He is not saying you were killed by the, you did not understand the power of Ram and you were killed by the Ram. She says you did not understand the power of Sita <coughs> and because of her curse, you were killed by her. So, normally, we think that we are going to become an instrument for God. But here, the way she is putting it is that God becomes an instrument for Sita. <laughs> so, Sita's curse comes through Ram. And then, in the last verse, she says that now Lanka has become Vidwa. Because of your departure, Lanka has become a widow. And not only has Lanka become a widow, but your body has become a destination for the animals to eat and your soul is going to go to them. So in one sense, it's a very um, distress-filled and gloomy overview. Now everything is lost. Whatever he had lived for, it's gone. But even in these verses, her wisdom comes out. And what was it that drove her on? That she kept trying to give good advice to Ramana. And as some, she was always there with him. So now Mandodari was the son of, the daughter of Mayadana and an Apsara Hima. And when Ravan was going around the universe conquering various places, so at that time he came to Mayadana. Now Mayadana is a, who is he? What is the distinguishing characteristic? Can anyone know? Sorry? Black arts. Black arts, yeah. Architect. Architect, yes, thank you. He is the architect for the Asuras. Just like who is the architect for the Vishwakarma. Yeah. So now, Mayadana is a character who is, you could say, if you have black and white, then if you broadly say that the Devutas are white, the Asuras are black. Although Maya is a Dana, he is not entirely demonic. And he is somewhere on the shades of grey, towards the black but on the shades of grey. So, Mandodari, so he is attracted, Ravana is attracted to Mandodari and he marries her and then he um, has three sons through her. So, Indraji, Atikara and <coughs> then there is Ajay, Aksha. Now, Aksha is killed by Hanuman. Uh, then after that, Atikaya and Enrujita also, they fall in the, in the war in Lanka. And eventually, Ravana himself falls. So by this time, now, Mandukari has lost everyone. She has lost her sons, she has lost her husband. So it's a state of utter bereavement work. And if we see, Mandodari throughout gives uh, advice to Rao. In fact, when uh, he abducts Sita and comes, he also knows that because of the curse, I cannot oh, forcibly violate Sita. Of course, Sita doesn't know that at that time. And he basically adopts a typical strategy which he thinks will win over Sita. Normally, we say if a boy wants to woo a girl, then he will praise her beauty, he will brag about his wealth, and he will trash his competition. So he does the same three things. The, he, he first he approaches Sita and quite explosive verses which describes Sita's beauty. And Sita is taken aback initially. 
So this is the sage why he is speaking like this. And then he reveals, I am Dunkey. And now, I, Sita is not all impressed by him. And then he says, ah, what can he give you? He is just a, he doesn't even have a kingdom now. But then Sita pays no attention to him. He thinks that, let me take her with me and I will show her my kingdom. And my palace. And he takes her on a tour of his palace. And Sita is not even interested in seeing anything. And then finally, <coughs> Sita says that I will not even stay in this palace because I am with my husband, with Ram, and as long as Ram is exiled and he stays in the forest, I will also stay in the forest. So she also she stays in Ashokwarika. And at that time, Mandodari also says that you know, unless, you, unless she gives her consent, don't break her inside. So Mandodari also takes a strong stand over there. And eventually, when Ravan gets very angry with Sita and tries to kill Sita uh, because she is not ready to consent, then Mandodari intervenes and says, you know, what good you get by killing the woman? <coughs> so, there are times when we have two options and the first option is bad and the other option is worse. <laughs> so, there, if there is a good and bad option, it's easy to choose, relatively speaking. But if the only options are a bad and a worse option, then what do you do at that time? So, Mandodari, she keeps trying to at least minimize Ravana's interests. And she gives advice, but he never listens to it. So basically, <coughs> this is the background, and here what she is saying in this verse is, Ha Hatta, now we have been killed. So we can say that Ravana met the just deserts of his actions. But could he have chosen differently? And in the Sunday class, I speak about how you know Ravana had 10 different people gave him advices. So he had 10 heads, and each of those 10 advisors he rejected, then he lost one by one all the heads. So, Vandodari also gave him advice, but eventually when uh, she makes an emotion he says that when Andrajit is killed, he says that, you know, the fire of your lust for Sita has now burned everyone in Lanka. He says, it has now burned your own son, so I can live no longer. In the fire that will cremate my son, let me die also. Is how many more people will you do uh, burn in this fire of lust? Just give her up. But he never listens. So it, now when somebody is so obstinate and not able to not change, not ready to change at all, now you might say that some people are just evil. So broadly speaking, if we see there are two broad theories of human nature. Of course, there may be many, but we'll talk about two broad. <clears throat> so there is the Judeo-Christian theory of human nature, and there is the modern leftist or communist theory of human nature. The Judeo-Christian theory of human nature is that every one of us is sinful. Because the original man hadn't sinned against God, and because of that, he ate the forbidden apple. And therefore, sin is passed down everyone like a genetic defect. And everybody is innately sinful. Now, this theory is opposed by communism. Uh, communism is a whole body of thought, socialism is there. But the whole left, they say that actually people are innately good, it is society that makes them bad. And their solution is, so the Christian solution is that it is only God's grace which can save us from our innate sinfulness. Whereas the, uh, the communist theory is that it is what we need is social engineering. That means if somebody is behaving badly, it's because society treated them badly. And we change the social conditions. Give them better conditions and then they will start behaving better. 
So now, if we ask the general cross section of people, I've done this uh, survey in companies and colleges. You know, uh, how many of you think that people are innately good? What do you think? Are people innately good? Okay. Okay, thank you. Are people innately bad? No. Okay. Are some people innately bad? <laughs> With almost nobody says, are people innately bad? Nobody says yes to that. But as soon as you say, are some people innately bad? Almost everybody can think of some person. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, it is actually much easier to love humanity than to love one human being. <laughs> so, in the abstract, yeah, people are good. But this person is not good. This person is a terrible person. People can change, but this person will never change. So, it's like that. So, basically, uh, when you have this whole nuanced statement uh, that are some people innately bad, almost everybody raises that. that there's some people, yeah, they may be bad. And you can think about psychopaths, you can think about sociopaths, you can think about terrorists. You know, there can be people who are horrible. So, I was that one person who was Jew who was become a devotee. So he was telling me that his grandfather, or he was a part of the, he was a part of all those people who were killed in when in Nazi Germany he had Hitler. Hitler was having a pogrom to kill everyone, Jewish. So anyway, so at that time they were all a part of. They tried to overthrow uh, Hitler. There's many when many Germans themselves with Hitler's plan of trying to. Uh, to win the world is not going to work and you should surrender. So, the gen some of his generals themselves worked against him. So, there are three of his generals and they tried to assassinate him and he survived. And when he came to know about it, he decided to have them killed. But he had them hung, not normally with a rope, he hung them with like plastic bags. And what happened with the plastic, plastic, the rope was such like, it kept cutting their neck for 11 days. So they were hung for 11 days in mortal pain. And so the, as you could say, to produce suffering simply for the purpose of producing suffering. That is the very essence of evil. There is good in the, see there is a difference between tragedy and evil. Bad things happen. You know, say somebody is a drunk driver and they ran into someone and the person gets paralyzed, gets permanently paralyzed. That's terrible, that's, that's a tragedy. And when we encounter tragedy, it is difficult. Why did this happen to me? But actually even more difficult than to deal with tragedy is to deal with evil. Evil is, so tragedy is where something or someone somehow hurts us. But evil is when somebody systematically, maliciously, cold-bloodedly goes out to hurt us. So to evil means what? That to produce suffering simply for the cause of producing suffering. That there's no, no purpose in it. Just like a doctor does surgery, that suffering. But that has a purpose. So you could say that there is there can be purposeful suffering, which is like a surgery or injection. There can be purposeless suffering. It is purposeless means, at least from our perspective, say somebody uh, just slips and falls down and fractures themselves, a car runs over them accidentally because of a driver is in a tent. But when there is, uh, there is suffering which is purposefully caused, but it is purposeless. <laughs> it is purposefully caused. It means you are deliberately wanting the other person to suffer. But that suffering, why are you causing it? Just so that you can get joy in seeing the other person suffer. So that is called as sadism. Sadism is where somebody delights in causing pain to others. What is the example of sadism in our tradition? Narad intervened and stopped someone. 
Regarding it, yes. He got joy in seeing the pain of the animals. So basically, when we see the pain, most of us, we live in a very sheltered world. So, of course, the world is not a place of shelter in the sense that everybody gets trouble. But to have somebody target us, that just target us for no reason except the cause of interest. But that can actually shake your shake one's faith in the very uh, very nature of being. That means why do I exist? Why do they exist? Somebody suggests they, they experience malevolence. Malevolence is where somebody just deliberately goes out of their way to hurt us. So when such evil is encountered, you know, our whole worldview shakes. So the idea that people are innately good is something which we all would like to be. At least you would like people to believe that I am innately good. <laughs> but even a real, a little encounter with real life will expose us to people who are evil. Somebody, many kya bigada hai tumara? You know what have I done? What have I done? Why are you troubling me like this? So sometimes these people get us, and then it's it's unless we have. A theory of evil, that means a worldview which acknowledges the presence of evil. We can't, we can't make sense of what is happening with that. So basically, so these two theories are there, that the Christian theory that people are innately bad, and of course it doesn't really say they're innately bad because everybody is a part of God. In the sense of God, not everybody is part of God, that's our way of saying it. There is that everybody is made in the image of God. But still, although we are made in the image, but we are covered over by the sin. And without the intersectionary grace of Jesus, we cannot be revealed. Now the problem with this worldview, <coughs> that people are innately evil, is that there are people who are good also. Not everybody is equally innately evil. You can see people who may not be uh, say, saved by Jesus. But they are virtuous, they are charitable, they are kind. There are good people. There are definitely bad people, but there are good people also. But the problem with the communist worldview is that where it says that there is nothing innate about people, it is situations that make them the way they are. Then we see that two people may go through the same situations, but they may respond entirely differently. Two people may be born in poverty, they may be born in they may go through abuse and still now one grows up to grows up to become a very bitter and hateful person and the other grows up and grows beyond their child, beyond what they are going through. So neither theory is actually born, uh, is supported by evidence. But to, there is something called evil. So the Vedic worldview, the Gita's worldview is that basically we have to understand that there are two levels of innateness. When we talk about innate, what do we mean by it? That inside us, there is the soul and there is the body. So there is the mind. And beyond that is the body. So when we talk about inside us, there is innateness. So what are we referring to by innate? So at the level of the soul, because every soul is a part of God, Mamai Mamishu Jeeva Yoki, Jeeva Bhuta Sanatana. Because every soul is a part of God, so we can say, we all have an innate potential for good. <clears throat> I'll explain why this word potential. But then beyond that, there's another level of innateness that is the mind. And the mind carries impressions from the past. And because of these impressions from the past, uh, they also affect how we behave. And if those impressions from the past are bad, then at the level of the mind, we can say some people are innately evil. In fact, this is how uh, when I read the Bhagavad Gita for the first time, or not the first time, the first few times, the 16th chapter where Krishna describes the divine and demonic nature. Well, now the, the analysis is 
profoundly contemporary and profoundly scary in terms of how Krishna describes the demoniac nature. But one thing which puzzled me, even disturbed me, is Krishna says Abhijahatu say. That in 16.3, when he's describing the Daivi Prakriti, and 16.4, he's describing the Asuri Prakriti, and both he says Abhijahatu For example, Dambho Dharpo Manascha Krodha Parishamevacha Agyanam Chavijatasya Partha Sampadam Asuri. That Abhijahatasya, that is born. So this is the name, the demo, those who are born with demonic nature have these qualities. Arrogance, harshness, ignorance, anger, whatever. And like that he gives a list of the divine qualities also. So now Abhijata says, what does this mean? If, the, if you are born with it, then it becomes innate, isn't it? Then is it changing? So of course, if, it were, if we were just like programmed machines, that we couldn't change anything. Then Krishna's instructions towards the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Tasmat Shastram Pramanam Te Karya Karya Vasita Gyanva Shastra Vidhanottam Karma Kartum Iharasi. Therefore, act according to Shastra. Act according to Shastra. That means you have a particular nature, but act in a way that will help you to get it. So when Krishna is using the word Abhijatasya over here, he is basically referring to not the soul but the mind. That some people from their past bring impressions which will make them evil. And some people may have impressions which make them good. So I use two distinct words over here. See, we all have a potential for good. But we also have a propensity for evil. And the potential for good has to struggle against the propensity for evil. And only then it will manifest. So it's so by default, is it that people will, people are good and they will act in good ways? Maybe most likely not. Most likely not. Because bad things happen to everyone. Now we may be good people, but when bad things happen, it's like you start feeling doing bad things in return to those people. And the dark side within us comes out. So there is a potential for goodness within us. But there is also a propensity for grace. And the essential human struggle is for the potential for goodness to manifest in spite of the propensity for grace. And to the extent we take on this struggle, to the extent the goodness will manifest. But if somebody doesn't take up this struggle, then now everybody has some good impressions within them, some bad impressions within them. Even and the demoniac people also, there is some good within them. And I talked in the Sunday class about why uh, Mandodre refers to Ravan as Mahabhava and how he is able to, uh, how he does, how he pays the good watch. But essentially, so we all, uh, are, are some people innately evil? Yes, in the sense that some people may have very deep, innate negative impressions in them. It may be lust, it may be anger, it may be greed, it may be envy, whatever it is. And that might make them behave in terrible ways. So, we cannot deny this level of past impressions, but we can also see beyond those past impressions. So the, the way we reconcile the two is that actually, like I said, the problem with the Christian worldview that if people are innately evil, then why are some people good? When some people are good because the impressions within them may not be bad. Some people may have bad impressions, some people may have good impressions. And are people products of their situations? Yes, we are, but not entirely. Our situations influence us you could say they impel us, but they don't compel us. They push us to act in certain ways, but we can push back. And both against our impressions and against our situations, we with our potential for goodness have to struggle. And when we struggle and succeed, that's how we fulfill the purpose of human life. So how this struggle can be done successfully, I'll talk in the Sunday's class. I'll summarize here, we can have a few questions. 
I spoke on this topic of are ah, people innately good or innately bad? I started by talking about Mandodari how she had a close view. That her view of Ravan's, although she saw that Ravan was doing evil, so her choice was she was already married to Ravan. So a bad and a worse choice. So bad choice, she was already there in that situation. So she kept minimizing the especially egregious choices that Ravan was doing. And she tried to, she tried to do things, stop it. And <clears throat> so then we discuss these two theories of human nature. One, the uh, Judeo Christian theory that people are innately, sin, innately sinful because of the original sin, and the uh, leftist theory that people are innately good. So, the, Judea, uh, the Christian theory holds that we need divine grace to give up sin and become good. Whereas the communist, the leftist idea says that we need social engineering to become good. And the problem is that people, even without getting divine grace, can act as good. And people, even in terrible situations, can also grow from the situation still not become bad, but, but become good. So the Vedic understanding is that there are two levels of innateness. That at the level of the soul, everybody has a potential for goodness. But at the level of the mind, everybody has different impressions and we have a propensity for vice. And the essential human struggle is for the potential for goodness to struggle beyond and rise beyond the propensity for vice. So when we learn to do that, then we can fulfill the purpose of our human life. Any questions or comments? Yes, Krishna Sharma. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Thank you for uh, an amazing class. My question relates to uh, you know when we deal with people closely in the outside world. Uh, you know, we see people who are uh, having very good qualities, say what you were saying about, you know, innately good in the terms of mind. You know, it's, like you were distinguishing between the soul having the potential and mind in terms of uh, sanskar or virtue. So we see people, innately good people, you know. Uh, so for example, you may see someone, you know, who is who is not practicing any spirituality at all, but uh, you know, the way they deal with other humans, you know, the general compassion they have in situations, you know, an understanding level is sometimes very high, at least, you know, so sometimes when you see such people, you wonder, is it that, you know, they had some emotional credit in the past, or maybe some support in their system somehow because of which they are manifesting. So how do you see such people? That's my first part of the question. And the second part of the same question is, we also, at least I have also sometimes, you know, closely seen and some colleagues or people who we deal with very closely for many, many years, that some of them, you know, they may even have simple habits. So for example, uh, you know, eating of meat and things like that may be very common in their daily routine. But still, in terms of uh, you know, patience, compassion, again, qualities in terms of how they deal with humans, it tends to be outstanding. And sometimes I, I used to feel that maybe they are putting a show, but then when you see the same person over several years, you know, having certain personal vices, but at the same time, you know, manifesting you know, certain qualities are really appreciable. Then again the question comes, you know, how do we see that from the light of our Shastra, for example, because he may not necessarily be doing activities which are sattvic, right? maybe very tamasic in his personal life, but how is it that he is able to manifest something? Actually, it's coming because, uh, you know, some examples that I have encountered in our office or situations where we've seen people very closely for almost 20 years, you know, and, you know, fed to live so, I just wanted to... Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so, if I summarize the question that sometimes people may have no emotional or spiritual connection but still they are good and not only, they are very thoughtful, insightful, sensitive and even if they are having some habits like meditating which are sinful, still they, they, they are actually very good in their other degrees. So, how do we understand this? Yeah. Now, those who have a 
when somebody has a hammer, everything appears like a nail to them. <laughs> so what that means is that now when we take scripture, uh, now scripture helps us to make sense of the world. But then the world is very complicated. Scripture is also anek shastram bahuvegita. We just take one point from scripture and we impose it on all over the world. And it doesn't work like that. So, let's get some basics right. Actions have consequences. So, if somebody is doing something wrong, right now, it is going to have some results. But, if somebody is presently manifesting some virtues, now one of the, I was in America and there's one uh, Canadian intellectual who's taken the world by storm currently. He's, he's, he's a, quite conservative, he accepts the existence of, at least uh, accepts the existence of God, he draws from biblical teachings. But his diet is only meat. No, he doesn't even put salt on it. All three meals is only meat. <laughs> and basically, he and his, in his whole dynasty, they have autoimmune disease. And they have autoimmune disease. So his daughter who had very severe disease, he also had indication of that disease. So morning after he just takes meat and his daughter is completely cured of that. And he is also much healthier than what he is. So now, and there are some devotees, based on his diet, they demonize him. But he's actually bringing a lot of people to sattva and bringing people a lot of, look, towards spirituality. So now, obviously, the particular diet he's having, uh, we wouldn't recommend that, put it mildly. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you can, say there is a, in, in logic, there is an error called the error of the antecedent. Error of the antecedent means if A, then B. Then, if B, then A. What I mean is that if it rains, the pavement will be wet. Mm -hmm. That is, that is, okay, if A, then B. But today morning I wake up and I see the pavement is wet. Therefore, it must have rained yesterday. If B, then A. Not necessary. Not necessary. That means, it could be that maybe there is a water leakage somewhere. It could be that somebody was watering, was watering the garden and some water sprayed over. There could be other causes also. Unless you can say that A is the only cause of B. Cannot say that just when B is present, A has to be present. So A will lead to B. So basically, causal connections are subtle. It's not just A to B. So, uh, or rather if B then A. That it doesn't work like that. So what I'm, the point I'm making is here, that if some people are behaving in a particular way right now, that is, that is they have an effect on their consciousness. But it may not necessarily have an immediate effect. Because say, as you rightly said, that if somebody has been living in, maybe in the past they will sattva. Or maybe in this life, their remaining life is in sattva. But that particular activity is very much in Raju Sartans. So, there are certain behaviors which affect us. But how much what will affect will depend on the overall way a person is living. So we, uh, so we don't minimize or deny the consequences of certain wrong actions. But if somebody is speaking wisdom, somebody is having uh, insight, then to go backward and say, okay, this cannot be inside because this person is eating it. No, if the person is insightful, they are insightful. Right? So we can't impose, in fact, there is, uh, in the Bhagavatam itself, there is uh, a reference in the 11th canto to the, uh, the Vyakra Gita. You know, there is the hunt, there is the butcher who speaks wisdom. And in the 11th canto, Uddha Gita Krishna refers to him that how bhakti can manifest in anyone. And there in the Mahabharata, the, the, the incident is there in the Mahabharata. And basically, it's a long story. But Essentially, the point is that there's a Brahmana who is very proud of his Brahminical prowess. And then he, <coughs> some bird angers him and just curses, he just glares at the bird and the bird dies. And then he tries, you know, he goes to a house to back Brahms and they, 
lady doesn't give arms immediately, so he gets angry with her. And she says, you know, I'm not like that bird who gives her. He says, oh, why? Oh, what? How did you know? He says, I'm serving, I'm taking care of my family responsibilities, so I'm protected by virtue. So he's impressed by that. He says, uh, uh, how can I learn more about virtue? She says, you go to that butcher. And then he goes to that butcher, and that butcher speaks wisdom. And now, he says, how can somebody in the butcher speak wisdom? So now, what the Mahabharata says over there is that, what goes into your heart, mouth is not as important as what comes out of your mouth. Now we may say that, what goes into your mouth will reflect what will come out of your mouth. That is true, but how long will it take? <laughs> that may vary. See, it's like karma works in different ways for different people. That means, if somebody has, uh, we generally talk about good things and bad things happening to people. And we give the example of dealing. If you say, if somebody is doing bad karma, they are not getting any results. Bad acting was, they have done some bad karma, good karma in the past, that's what uh, is protecting them. But that can apply to their actions also. Somebody is doing one bad activity right now, but that may not reflect necessarily in their behavior. Because their remaining life might be virtuous. And their past might be virtuous. So, if somebody is virtuous right now, we can recognize that they are virtuous. So, generally, when I started by saying that everything seems to be like a, a nail to somebody who has a hammer, so sometimes we use philosophy uh, to hammer labels on people. But we have to use philosophy as a tool for understanding the reality. And reality is complex, philosophy is also complex. And how the two work together, it is, it is not easy to understand that. And that is actually, I would say that's a, uh, in English there is a word, ideological hobby horse. <laughs> what that means is that everybody has their pet ideological explanation, why things are wrong. So, oh, so the communists will say that, why are things so terrible? Because the capitalists are so evil. The capitalists ask them, why are some things so terrible? The workers are so lazy. Now, the reality is that, yes, some workers are lazy. Some capitalists are evil. But not all capitalists are evil. Not all, all workers are lazy. So basically, when we adopt a particular philosophy, it is, it is a common temptation in every philosophy, adopting a very philosophical ideology, to just as soon as you see the situation, you just ride on your ideological hobby horse. That means, give some oversimplified explanation for some action. But reality is complex. And that doesn't mean philosophy can't explain, our, our philosophy can't explain particular reality, but it is said our philosophy has to be seen in terms of multiple factors. So, as like Jad Bharat, he, Bharat Maharaj, was attached to a deer, so he became a deer. So now if he became a deer, then what happened? You could say that is the law of Yamim Vapis for Bhav that happened. But the same Bhagavad Gita says, Neha Vikrama Nashu Skills. So he was all of it lost? No, it was not lost. Because although he got a deer body, he did not get deer consciousness. So he had human consciousness. So basically, when I said Neha Vikrama Nashu Skills, that, that orientation towards spirituality will not be lost. So, there are both laws that apply. So, sometimes multiple factors may be working and we cannot, uh, we cannot reduce reality to an oversimplified model where based on one parameter we judge everything. One of the, I think in my previous visit I had mentioned that humility means to acknowledge the complexity of reality. So, if we acknowledge that, the complexity of reality, then rather than forcing reality into the mold that our philosophy insists. We just look at the reality, look at the philosophy and then try to make sense of both. Okay. Okay. Uh, do we have time? Can you continue? Okay. The long question. Yeah. You have a question? You can ask that. My question is understanding what exactly is offense because what I have seen, what Prabhupada writing is acting out of envy, but then that may not be on the level of mind, or maybe on the level of mind or the soul. So that is, and how it is that uh, 
Bhagavatam Kapil Dev is saying about three kinds of bhakti, you know, Abhisandaya, Himsa, with the purpose of uh, Himsa. Mm. So, how do we understand this? Exactly what is offense and these three things? Okay. I don't think this is going to require a long answer. Okay. <laughs> I'll try to keep it as quick as possible. <coughs> so, what is offense and what do we mean by bhakti in three modes or say especially bhakti involving Himsa? Yeah. Uh, offense, at least the serious one. So you could generally words can have multi-level meanings. <coughs> Just like in Krishna Prasad. You now we can say that you can any food that is vegetarian, you can offer it to Krishna and take it, that's prasad. And you could say that food that is cooked by devotees, that is harvested by devotees, that is served by devotees, that is prasad. So it's a spectrum. <laughs> now, now <coughs> different people may situate themselves at different levels of spectrum. That is right. And that's okay. Like somebody is asking non vegetarian food. That's absolutely true. So, with respect to offense, you could have a multi, multi level like a spectrum of meaning. So, at one level, it is said that if you see a devotee and you're not happy, that's an offense. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> now, I mean, you commit many offenses. <laughs> there's one devotee who asks, hmm, there's so many devotees actually unhappy. Maybe I should not come in the association of devotees to award offenses. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's a misapplication. So, the idea is that, in general, if we are connected with Krishna, if we see somebody else connected with Krishna, then we will feel happy to see them connected with Krishna. But quite often what happens, we are not so Krishna conscious. So when we see others, we don't see how they are connected with Krishna, we see how they are connected with us. Or how they are dealing with us, and we may feel that they are dealing with us badly. They may have also. So it becomes a little difficult. So I would say that is not a it's not a serious offense. It's not that we, we should feel angry when we see devotees. We are feeling negative, we try to avoid that. And we try to cultivate some uh, cultivate some conscious, do some conscious contemplation about their good qualities also, so that we don't keep thinking negatively about them. Uh, maybe not when we see them, but even before we see them, we try to think of their good qualities. So that's, but that's not a very serious offense. A very serious offense would be where we consciously act to pull down some devotee. Mm -hmm. When we see somebody being praised, and we can't be near their praise. And then we forget them. We say, somebody gives very good classes. And then somebody is glorifying them. Well, I guess it's good classes. You see how much prasad he is? <laughs> <laughs> so, don't think it's a great person. It's a it's like pulling down something consciously. And this is also a small way of pulling down. But they can be much more serious way of pulling down this. But I think that when we are unable to tolerate the praise of something, and we want to pull them down, either literally by by literally by literally dragging them down and trying not to put them in That's very serious offense. So now with respect to bhakti being performed by Sindha and Now <coughs> uh, I was talking with Sri Prabhupada disciple and he told me that devotees can be more wonderful than you can imagine. And devotees can be more dreadful than you can imagine. <laughs> Sometimes you see some devotees, they're so, so, so compassionate, so tireless, so enthusiastic, against Herculean difficulties. Now I was in America and I met one young devotee girl, she had cancer, and she was serving in 15, 16 years. She was so cheerful throughout, on the hospital with her. I asked her, you know, how, how are you saying you can go to spirits? And she said, right. You know, there is enough hap there is enough misery in this world. The world doesn't need one more miserable person. I'm <laughs> 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 stunned by the thought process itself. <laughs> so uh, you can literally be amazed at how good devotees are. And sometimes sometimes you'll say, how can somebody who behaves like this be a devotee? How can a devotee do like this? So you'll have the whole step. Why? Because the word devotee itself is elastic. <laughs> <laughs> so we may say that devotee means somebody who is chanting 15 rounds or who is initiated or is coming to the temple chanting Hare Krishna. There's elasticity in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's answer to the question also. Who is, who is the devotee? Satya Rajkhana says that. 
uh, it gives different levels of answers. So <coughs> we could say that uh, rather than saying oh, how can a devotee do such a terrible thing, or if somebody does such a terrible thing, how can they be a devotee? What we could say is that that you know, if they had not been devotees, they would have been even worse things. So we talk about the innate evil that is there within everyone. So that is like the level of the mind. That is there in some people more than others. And we call that more than others. Uh, so they will continue. That may just manifest. So now if that is happening, we have to keep a distance from them. So sometimes some devotees, uh, they may decide that what they are doing is devotional service, but it may not be. Sometimes some devotees get a conception that um, get, get a conception that uh, you know, this particular person is enemy. This one devotee, you know, he, 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 and not just one, but many, for many it has happened, but this particular devotee, another devotee reported this incident and it struck me. Says this devotee was uh, stole that, you know, you are deviating from Prabhupada and he got a death threat. But interestingly, the mail was, Dear Prabhu, please accept my humble obeisances. <laughs> and if you don't stop doing this, that will be the last day of your life. You are servant. So, what's going on here? <laughs> so we could say there are the there is having the external forms of uh, devotee conversation. Why? Because he's developed that conception. And he's thinking, uh, what I'm doing is devotional service. And I'm protecting Prabhupada's mission. Whatever. So that's why when somebody starts doing it himself and they think it is worthy, then that is the only that is one situation. So generally it is good people will be good, bad people will be bad. And if some devotees are being bad, that usually means that it is because they had a lot of evil within them. But that evil, that evil is not yet complete because that's why they are doing wrong things. But I am now talking about exceptional things. Where if some devotees start thinking that what they are doing is right, then, then, even good people may do bad things because they think that they are doing it for a good cause. Now whether that cause is good or not, that is, let us be carefully understood. And that's why it's important for each one of us uh, to not live in our own, in English it's called echo chamber. Echo chamber means that say, if I am alone in a particular room, then I speak loudly, and just my own voice echoes back to me. So then similarly, some people who are of a particular, say, worldview, or even within bhakti, a particular conception of how bhakti is to practice, that if they live in their own echo chamber, then they start thinking, what I am doing is right. And anybody who is doing anything different is wrong. So that's why it's very important that even when devotees have differences of opinion, that that's in the discussion. So, see, it's uh, when discussion stops, it is not that the argument stops. Rather, when discussion stops, bloodshed begins. So, uh, if, if there, are, there will be differences, blood was, if there will be differences, but if we are living in our echo chambers, then that's when it happens that somebody good may start doing something bad because they think thinking they're living for good purpose. But if then they hear from other people, other perspectives, then this one is okay, you know, it's not as simple as it thought it was. So that's how sometimes devotees may do some violence also uh, while practicing Bhakti. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, we will have more questions on the Sunday session. So Gantraj Bhagavatam Ki, Krishna Prabhupada Ki, Gaura Bhakta Dinda Ki, Yeah. Yeah. This devotee has sent on question.